This vial contains one of the most important substances on Earth, antibiotics. These now ubiquitous chemicals have had possibly the most revolutionary effect on human society. But because they're so common and part of our lives, we don't often think about how much better life is because of their discovery, and how recently they were discovered. Bring out your dead! Bring out your dead! Before antibiotics, life was pretty miserable. Not only could one bad paper cut be the end of you, there are so many diseases caused by microbes that used to haunt humanity. Even if they didn't kill you, you could end up disfigured or in pain for most of your life. Or the special bonus option, in pain, disfigured, and it kills you. Leprosy, tuberculosis, the literal plague, and more was just a fact of life. And pooping yourself to death was incredibly common. It's food poisoning. I have it too. I did not sleep for one second last night, and I cracked the bottom of the toilet bowl. For at least 2,000 years, we've had some idea that infection was spread by tiny seed-like particles. And as early as 500 years ago, germ theory started to really take hold, as microscopes were invented and people began to study the microscopic world. But just because we knew that the microbes were there doesn't mean we could do much about it. We've had some herbal remedies over the years, but their efficacy was very hit and miss, and nothing that could be easily industrialized. For example, before proper antibiotics, oil extracted from chalmugra nuts was the only treatment for leprosy that had any reasonable effect. But to get it in you, they had to inject oil under your skin, which was exactly as painful as it sounds, and the side effects were just about as fun. But your choice was that, or life in a leper colony. It's no wonder that we would often ascribe these ailments to offending a particular god or spirit. When you're powerless to do anything about it, you at least want somebody to blame. Because of this, for the vast majority of human history, you were lucky to make it past 40. That's not to say people didn't, but way more died young, especially as babies. The only solution humans really found to this was to just have enough kids that, on average, some of them would make it to adulthood. Which, I'm going to be honest, not a great solution. This all changed thanks to an organism that you probably don't particularly like. Blue mold. Mold is literally everywhere. It's in the air, it's on your skin, and mold spores are on basically every surface unless that surface has been carefully sterilized. And while it's always frustrating to find your nice loaf of bread has taken on a blue hue, this amazing critter changed the world for the better in a big, big way. Throughout history, various physicians all over the world noticed that fungi had interesting properties that made them useful as medicine. But while there was occasional usage of mold to treat infection, ancient practitioners didn't know why it worked and couldn't isolate the chemical that was doing the real work. In the 1800s, as microbiology was really starting to develop, there were several reports that growth medium contaminated with mold wouldn't allow bacteria to grow. And a few people had written about the effects of mold. But beyond a few cases of treating infection with a sort of mold poultice, it didn't really go anywhere. But thanks to a happy accident in 1928, Scottish physician Alexander Fleming stumbled onto the same phenomena. He was trying to grow a culture of S. aureus on a petri dish. This common pathogen is still a regularly occurring culprit behind infections, but by lucky happenstance, the temperature was set too cold, and one of the plates had gotten contaminated by blue mold. This allowed the mold enough time to grow before the bacteria really could, and as a result, there was a distinct dead zone around the mold when he went to check on the plate. It was this moment that clued him into the idea that the mold must be producing some substance that can effectively kill bacteria. Now, Fleming was not a chemist, so he turned to his colleagues for help. And after isolating and verifying the substance, it was named penicillin after the mold it had come from, penicillium. But in classic human fashion, the paper that he wrote and ended up publishing about penicillin made almost no noise in the medical world. It wasn't until the 1940s that another research team, led by Howard Florey, decided to study the compound for use in actual medicine. And even then, it still took them years to figure out how to culture the mold and extract the drug at a useful scale. But by the mid-1940s, penicillin started to be widely available and used. 
Not only did this give us the natural antibiotics like penicillin, but it also allowed for the discovery of the semi-synthetic derivatives that had even more potent effects. Things like amoxicillin, ampicillin, and more. Today, we're going to recreate that process that Florian Co. figured out and make our own penicillin from scratch. And you'll be surprised to find that it's actually a remarkably straightforward process. We decided to do this project because of the sponsor of this video, wikisiv.org. They're building a wiki for rebuilding civilization, and making antibiotics is one of the many key skills humanity needs to thrive. The project is still relatively new, so if you'd like to help expand the articles that are already there, or check out what's already been written, head to wikisiv.org after this video. Now, while penicillin is the star of today's show, it is hardly the only antibiotic that is grown from convenient microbes. In fact, you are surrounded by antibiotic-producing microbes all the time. Let me show you what I mean. We're going to make a little science cocktail, and I'll only need two things. Water, and some dirt. Now, we're going to disturb the microbial residents of this mixture and see if we can isolate individual microbes. You're disgusting, Gert! Gert from around the globe spanning the centuries! <laughs> what have you done? England must never merge with France! After giving this a mix, we can take a one milliliter sample. Then, we need to dilute this to almost nothing. To do that, I'm going to take our sample and mix it with 9 milliliters of sterile water. Give that a shake, and then we dilute it again by taking a 1 milliliter sample and mixing it into 9 milliliters of more fresh sterile water. We repeat this until we have 6 to 8 tubes. This way, we'll have diluted the sample by at least a factor of a million. The first few tubes can be discarded, but starting from the most dilute, we can take a sample of each solution and spread them onto some petri dishes filled with a nutrient solution that has been solidified with agar. In this case, I'm using half-strength LB broth. If we let these dishes grow, we'll start to see something really amazing. While they're covered in colonies, some of those colonies have a very obvious dead zone around them. These are producing some sort of antibiotic, and with further tests, we could find out what this bacteria is and what it's making. And this method is how many medicines, not just antibiotics, were discovered. By screening environmental samples, you can find microbes that make incredibly complicated molecules that would be completely unreasonable to try and make in a chemistry lab. And those molecules can have amazing properties, not just the ability to kill bacteria. Now, while we could try growing the antibiotic from these random dirt microbes, we won't know if it's even a compound that's safe for human use without a lot of testing. So instead, we're going to go with classic penicillium mold. But we're not going to use just any random mold from the air. Instead, I got to engage in one of my favorite hobbies and bought this high-yield penicillin-producing strain online. Do you have any hobbies? I collect spores, molds, and fungus. This particular strain has been purposely mutated to overproduce the drug so it's useful industrially. Though the method by which they do that will be a topic for an upcoming video. So that way we could compare, I also picked up a normal strain of the mold. And sure enough, even just watching it grow, you can see a noticeable difference. The hyperproducing strain not only makes more penicillin, it also makes more colored metabolites. As it grows, you can see those metabolites leach into the agar. By the way, these nice time lapses were made using the new time lapse system that Reshape Biotech sent us. It's specifically made for analyzing microbes as they grow and has been an amazing tool for making this video and several of the ones coming up. So if you work in a lab that needs this kind of thing, there are some links below. Now, mold normally grows on things like bread, but we need to grow a tank of the stuff if we want to extract a usable amount of penicillin. So to do that, we finally have an excuse to show off our amazing bioreactor system. While it's definitely not 100% done, it's still quite a marvel. We had built smaller prototypes initially, but this beauty was the real star. The main shelf has space for 12 1.5 liter bioreactors, and each space has a built-in magnetic stirrer and heating collar that straps onto the reactors. There are also built-in thermocouples to monitor each bottle, and ports for feeding, inoculation, air, exhaust, and waste. And today, we're going to use it to run a big batch of penicillin production. Even though we are using a high-yield strain, we're still only going to get a relatively small amount of penicillin. The expected yield in the literature was at a maximum 1 to 3 grams per liter-ish. So we'll find out how close we can get to that. Now, because this is mold, it will grow on almost anything. But if we want to maximize our yield, we need to make a well-balanced growth medium. 
You'll see what I mean in a moment, but this whole process felt really weird. Normally when something starts to mold, you throw it out. You don't purposely grow it into a two inch thick slab or feed it carefully concocted food sources on purpose. I spent multiple hours researching the best thing to feed, mold. Though if I was going to be professionally cooking for mold, I made sure to wear my DNA Baking Club sweater, which is one of the many amazing designs we carry in our store. We've got Jerry merch, handmade posters, DNA, and living bacteria now, and so much more. So don't forget to check that out after this video. But I digress. The witch's brew that I ended up settling on for the mold was 15 grams of yeast extract, 10 grams of malt extract, 10 grams of peptone. These will provide all the major nutrients and aminos and all that kind of stuff. For carbon sources, I went with 10 grams of glucose and 35 grams of lactose. And for nitrogen, potassium, and phosphate, I went with 3 grams of ammonium nitrate and 4 grams of monopotassium phosphate. As an aside, I've had this particular bottle of ammonium nitrate since I first started experimenting in my dad's basement as a kid. It was harvested out of an instant cold pack back when they used to fill them with pure ammonium nitrate. Ah, the good old days. It's been in my collection approximately as long as I've been making videos, so since around 2011. Anyway, to set up a reactor, we have to mix all the ingredients with a liter of water, add a stir bar, and then close the lid. We normally also add a defoaming agent, but I forgot to film that. The hose barbs can't be left uncovered, so they get these custom-made silicone hats for transport and autoclaving. This keeps them clean and sterile while the reactor is handled, inoculated, and eventually installed in the machine. The reactor is completely autoclavable, so we can just put the whole thing into the autoclave for sterilization. When they've cooled completely, the sterile reactor can be brought into the lab for inoculation. Here I'm injecting a prepared mold solution that I'd grown overnight via the inoculation port. Finally, the silicone hats can be removed from the air input and exhaust, and then replaced with two sterile bits of silicone tubing and matching inline filters. These keep the air clean going in and prevents mold or microbes escaping the reactor through the exhaust. With a few presses of the touchscreen control panel to set up the experimental conditions, the reactor is off and running and just needs to be left to grow. The literature says that this can take up to a week or more, so we're gonna leave this at 25 degrees to grow. And grow it did. I assumed, apparently incorrectly, that the mixing and the liquid would mean that the mold would be well mixed in the solution. Uh, no. Instead, it grew a massive, thick pellicle that eventually started to ooze penicillin goo. When it's done, we can harvest our penicillin. Now, this is the point where it officially crosses from a biology video to a chemistry video. So it's time to bust out the Nile Red backdrop and some glassware. Removing the lid from the reactor reveals the horrifying fungal mass within. And wow, is it a disturbing level of solid. Oh god! Yeah, it's solid! Oh my fuck! Oh Jesus. It's like an egg. It is... That looks like an egg. Not unlike egg, yes. The more we poked at it, the more we realized that the only way to get it out was to treat it like a giant, horribly floaty omelette and remove it in scrambled egg-like chunks with a pair of glass stir rods standing in for chopsticks. With the majority of the omelette transferred to a secondary beaker, the main growth fluid can be filtered through a fritted funnel to remove any solids. The leftover chunks need to be rinsed to collect as much of the metabolites from the growing mass as possible. And, after a good mix, this too could be filtered and the liquid was added to our growing collection of penicillin solution. The residual solids can be discarded, or, for the truly deranged, plated and served. Now, this water solution has all kinds of things in it, but only some of them are penicillin. So, to isolate the penicillin itself, we're going to have to do what any good chemist trying to extract drugs out of living material would do. An acid-base extraction. What this entails is first adding a ton of salt to the solution. Here I'm using about 40 grams of ammonium sulfate and 100 grams of sodium chloride. This is then followed up with concentrated acid. Here I'm using hydrochloric, but phosphoric would have been preferred. We want the pH to be around 2 to 3, so we add the acid slowly until we hit that range. With a salty, acidic solution prepared, we can then add about 150 milliliters of ethyl acetate. The penicillin will be driven into the organic layer thanks to the acid and salt, so all we need to do is separate the two. 
Once everything has been well mixed to allow the penicillin to move into the organic layer, the mixture was added to a separatory funnel. Once things had separated, the layers were drained, one after the other, into clean beakers. We saved the water just in case we wanted to extract more penicillin from it later, but the final ethyl acetate solution was now a bright yellow from a mix of the penicillin and one of the colored metabolites that also came through. To try and remove the colored impurities, we added some charcoal to the mixture and then filtered it through some cotton. It was at this moment that I realized that I had bought regular charcoal instead of activated charcoal because most of the yellow had come right through. But the solution was much clearer, so I'll say it was good enough. Industrially, the way that they solved the yellow pigment problem, which was a known issue with this species of mold, was to just find a mutant that didn't produce any yellow pigment in the first place. But the pigment, known as chrysogene, actually has antibacterial and antiviral properties itself. So a tiny amount being mixed in here isn't the end of the world, and most of it will stay behind in the next step anyway, it'll just discolor the final penicillin. Speaking of which, the next step is to move the penicillin back into a water-based solution. And the way that we do that is the reverse of how we got it into the ethyl acetate in the first place. By adding about 30 milliliters of water that's been adjusted to a pH of about 8 with a tiny amount of sodium carbonate. This time, the penicillin will move to the water layer and leave the rest of the junk behind. Once again, we can separate the two layers, and when it's done, we're left with a slightly yellow solution of penicillin. Off camera, I took a small sample of this to use in a moment, but the rest was poured into a stainless steel tray and then loaded into our freeze dryer. This will remove all of the water and leave us with a penicillin powder that we can weigh to get our final yield. The next day, the solution was dry and we can harvest the powder. In total, we got a whopping 125 milligrams of penicillin, which is pretty far off the two to three grams we were expecting, but then again, it was our first try. There are lots of tweaks to the media, growth time, temp, and more that would probably be needed to get a higher yield. Or we should have just let it grow longer. Even then, I am pretty thrilled that we got a visible quantity. But let's test it to make sure it works properly. After re-dissolving the penicillin in 5 milliliters of water, we can filter sterilize the solution to remove any contaminating bacteria or spores that might be left over. This is important both for sterility, but also because a lot of microbes have evolved the ability to break down penicillin, so any contamination can ruin the batch. I prepared a petri dish by spreading E. coli into an even lawn on the surface, and then added a small piece of pre-sterilized filter paper. To this, I added about 20 microliters of our penicillin solution. Sure enough, when we let it grow overnight, we get the distinct dead zone we are expecting, which means that this worked! We successfully produced our own antibiotic from scratch. All told, it was a lot of fun recreating this essential process. And this basic cycle of growth, extraction, and purification is how so many of the marvelous chemicals we have available to us these days are made. So while penicillin was our test case, we just as easily could have used this system to grow other biologicals of interest, be it metabolites, proteins, or whatever else you're interested in. And we certainly have some long-running projects where growing and extracting lots of stuff might be useful. But that's where I'll leave it for now. Before you go, a quick reminder to check out the amazing new items we have in our store, and I also wanted to say a special thank you to our amazing patrons and channel members that help make these videos possible. Your support over the years through thick and thin and plague and tariffs has been a huge part of what let us keep making these videos. And if you're interested, patrons and members get access to our special supporter discord. If you're interested, there are some links below. But that's all for now, and I'll see you next time.